our peculiar situation in security is the possession of a written constitution. Let's not make it a blank piece of paper by construction. That's Thomas Jefferson. It's very important we understand why our founders decided to put this on a piece of paper so that future generations can always go back and understand that we are a rule of law, not a rule of men. A rule of law protects the individual. The rule of men allows a mob of democracy to, to crush the individual over the collective. Today, in that room right there, we have good men and women they are going to promise their oath, their oath to the Constitution. North Carolina, Article 6, Section 7, U.S. Constitution, Article 6, uh, Clause 3. But the true keepers of the Constitution, the true keepers of the oath, was what George Washington said is, we the people. Because if we don't hold them accountable, then it does become a blank piece of paper. We cannot allow that to occur. We are here today because we know in our gut, in our core, something is wrong in this country. When our inalienable rights, our Bill of Rights, are being attacked at every time we turn, but yet all 10 of Karl Marx's communist mental planks are law in our land today. That just makes no sense. Again, understand, all 10 planks of Karl Marx are law in North Carolina and the United States today, but yet we argue over our Bill of Rights. That is unacceptable. I love reading about the founders. I want to bring their words. This is, this is not a debate amongst myself and people today, but I want to go over the idea of what our founders said when they put this Constitution together. So I'm going to read a couple quotes here. Because we have to understand what the sovereign, what the supremacy clause really means and how it actually works because it does not make us sheeple or servants of a federal leviathan. James Madison, he knows something about the Constitution, states, the powers granted by the proposed Constitution are gifts of the people. They may be resumed by them when perverted to oppression, and every power not granted thereby remains with the people. That's the Constitution that we have. Not used today, but what we're supposed to go back to. We all know about Madison. I want to read some of our founders of North Carolina. So I really want the focus today is what happens when the federal government usurps their power. What, what power do we have as individuals? Archibald McLean, in the first convention of 1788, of North Carolina to vote for the Constitution. I'm gonna use James Erdell and, and uh, Archibald McLean. These men from 1788 uh, and 1789 were men who wanted the Constitution. So they were answering questions from anti-federals who are afraid of the Constitution. So let's look at their words concerning the, the Supremacy Clause. Archibald McLean, if Congress should make a law beyond the powers and the spirit of the Constitution, should we not say to Congress, you have not authored, uh, authority to make this law? There are limits beyond which you cannot go. You cannot exceed the power prescribed by the Constitution. You are amenable to, uh, to us for your conduct. This act is unconstitutional. We will disregard it and punish you for the attempt. Where is that yeah. today? Yeah. Yeah. James Erdell. James Erdell was a Federalist who was a proponent of the Constitution and such a scholar that a man named George Washington actually appoint him to the first Supreme Court of the United States of America. So here's a guy who understands the Supremacy Clause. If Congress, under pretense of exercising the power delegate to them, should in fact, by exercising any other power, usurp upon the rights of different legislators or any private citizen, the people will be exactly in the same situation as they've been expressed in provisions against such power. It would be an act of tyranny. And he further goes on, beyond these limits, those acts are void. Understand these words. That means the power is within us, the individual. The state legislator's protect, uh, function is to protect us from that. Again, this is not Greg Brand. This is James Iredell, a Federalist for the Constitution, expressing what the Supremacy Clause is. So the question we have is today is, where did our founders get this? They understood a thing called natural law. Natural law is, John Locke describes it as, the proper role of the government is to protect one's private property. And the most important private property is one's person, his mind, his body, his possessions. Blackstone wrote the Commentaries of English Law, which our founders use as a common textbook, actually law schools in the 1890s here, states there are three major, three first ideas of natural law are personal security, personal uh, liberty, and personal property. 
So therefore, a legitimate government is only legitimate if it protects one's inalienable rights. That's where Thomas Jefferson got it in the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. It's very clarified what our birth certificate is. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To secure those rights, a government instituted amongst men deriving their just powers from the governed. That's us. We give certain powers to this local, state, and federal level to allow us to live our life with liberty and pursuit of happiness. Any other government is illegitimate. Then he goes on and lists 29 things that King George did and called the tyrannical, uh, tyrannical government. I beg you to look at our Decorative Independence because we are there today. So again, the how is the Constitution. The why is the Decorative Independence. So I have a question. What happens when, again, we're the only country to this to date, and the first and only, where the individual is superior to the collective? That's a, that's a crucial thing to understand. Plato's Republic is where the producers are in place by the auxiliary or the military that keeps the guardians above them. And the guardians are exempt from law, but the producers are interchangeable. Our founders put that turned upside down. The individual is superior, and the government is a tool, not a master. That's crucial to understand. So what happens when you have the, uh, you have the uh, all three branches of the federal government overstep their bounds and pass laws that are unconstitutional, and we don't have men like James Urdell, Archibald McLean saying no. The act is called nullification. It is a tool that James Madison and, uh, and Thomas Jefferson did in the Virginia and uh, Kentucky Resolution stating we have a power under the 10th Amendment because it's very important to understand something. The Constitution is a contract. It's a compact. The two parties to that are the states. The agent is the federal government. The agent does not have the power to tell the parties what to do. So we must hold them accountable to that contract. Today is a great example, nationalized health care. We think today that we're so progressive and we so are advanced of, of, other, of other times in history. Jefferson said about health care, I'll paraphrase it here, if we ever allow the government to dictate what medicines or what health care you get, you'll be a, a poor soul as a tyrannical government. So are we going to allow the federal or state government to dictate what kind of health care and food we eat? That today is law on our land. Again, that is a communist manifesto plank. So Jefferson articulated that will be tyranny. Benjamin Rush, who Jefferson called actually the smartest intellect of the time during the founder's time, was actually a physician himself. And here's what he said how important health care was. Health care. Unless we put freedom into the Constitution, medical freedom into the Constitution, the time will come when medicine will organize into an under, underground dictatorship. That's today. All such laws are un-American and despots and have no place in a republic. The constitution of this republic should make special privileges for medical freedom as well as religious freedom. So those men understood if they controlled our food, our health, they controlled our lives and that led to tyranny. So there's no debate. We know in enumerated functions, Article 1, Section 8, there is no health care. The job of the legislators, as Madison said, are duty bound to interposition between us, the individual, and the Leviathan government. We don't ask for that, we demand that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I got a question today. Are we a republic of judiciary action, a government of executive orders? or even worse, a government of legislative policy wonks that want to social engineer our lives? No. If so, that is not a constitutional representative republic. That is a despotic tyranny. We say no more. My famous guy again, James Urdell, my famous quote for him. Tend this path, because we have a path we have to choose. He says, the security of our true liberty is in the jealousy of the people themselves. Well, we are here today to tell everybody in Raleigh and DC, we are jealous. Yeah. We are jealous of our liberty. Their paths are clear. Slavery, serfdom, or freedom and liberty. We choose liberty. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have an honor today to uh, a man who's been working most of his life actually fighting for those rights. We have Congressman Walter Jones here, 
who is beyond party. He's an American who understands his oath and understands the power of the individual being protected by that. It's an honor to call him a friend, an honor to call him up here to speak. Thank you very much.